6, Ephesians chapter 6. I want to begin reading at verse 1. We'll read through verse 9 uh, today. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, because this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you, and that you may have a long life in the land. Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your human masters with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as you would Christ. Don't work only while being watched as people pleasers, but as slaves of Christ. Do God's will from your heart. Serve with a good attitude as to the Lord and not to people, knowing that whatever good each one does, slave or free, he will receive this back from the Lord. And masters, treat your slaves the same way without threatening them, because you know that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Let us pray. Father, as we look to your word today, and we look at this final of three messages on the family, Lord, we pray today indeed that you would protect our families. Lord, even as we are here listening this morning, we pray for our children, whether they be here with us or whether they be away from us. And uh, Lord, uh, we know the power of prayer over our families. For those of us who are grandparents, may we be faithful to pray for our grandchildren as well as our children. And that Lord, you would be glorified. And we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. You know, on Wednesday evenings, we have been studying the book Concentric Circles of Concern. It was written uh, back, in, I believe, in the late 1970s by Dr. Oscar W. Thompson, who happened to have been an evangelism professor at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, uh, Dr. Thompson died at all too early of an age from cancer. However, uh, his wife, along with the assistance of a man named Claude King, were able to finish out this work and provide a new edition uh, for the book that we're able to study on Wednesday evenings. Uh, and when Dr. Thompson originally wrote the book, it was really to complement uh, his evangelism classes. So it was written for a teaching type of environment, but it can apply in all types of environments. And the basic premise of the book is all of life is really about relations and relationships and how the gospel flows through relationships. And as we go through the concentric circles, he begins really with self. And the first relationship that we have, of course, is with God. But right after our relationship with God, that next circle coming out from us is the family. And I believe Dr. Thompson is right that all relationships begin with God. But then after that, our relationships extend first into our immediate family. In fact, the family is God's first institution. Way before the church, before any nation, God established the family. And it's in the family that we learn how to relate to others. There's maybe no better evidence of that than uh, Karen's and my two and a half year old granddaughter, Karis. She has learned a lot in the past six weeks because she went from being the only child and having all of the attention to realizing that now she needs to share the attention and she's still in the process of, of learning that. But very seriously, the family is a beautiful thing that God has created. Even if we're an only child, we learn how to relate to our parents. Parents learn how to relate to children, husband to wife, wife to husband. And I believe strongly in this, that as the home goes, so goes the community and nation. Strong homes solidify communities. They solidify churches. And the beautiful thing is God doesn't leave us alone to figure this out. We close our study on the family today. It's a smaller part of a larger context. But today in God's plan for the family, part three, we look at two relationships, the child parent and the slave parent, or the slave master. The child parent is not limited to a particular time or culture. As long as children are being born, 
and they will be, the parent-child exists. But the master-servant relationship is limited by time and by culture. And at this time, I'm thankful slavery doesn't exist legally in our nation, but it does exist in behind closed doors. But there are places today where it does exist in our world. And, and so the question is, how does the slave respond to the master? You know, I began to wonder, and you probably did too as I read it, why is this relationship uh, included in the family? Well, it follows in the slave-master relationship, especially in the context that uh, Paul is writing here, and that the slave come, came under the authority of, of the household. The slave had regular interaction uh, with the home. And so we're going to look at that relationship some today, and we're going to look at it contextually in, in our culture. A lot of people say, well, why didn't the Bible address the issue of slavery? Well, a lot of times, many of the people who were enslaved were believers, and it was the institution that existed at that time. And Paul was writing because it couldn't change uh, immediately how to conduct oneself in that. And the thought is to relate to God. In fact, Christianity has been integral in eliminating slavery in so many areas around the world. And, and Paul's uh, attitude really in writing this was that if the masters would follow this particular instruction from God's word, that the institution of slavery would dissolve. Yet we do know that Paul was writing in a time when there were families, there were children growing up in the home, they were affected by the culture, uh, there were slaves or in the households of masters, and we'll see how God uh, instructs us in that. But first today, I want to look at the child-parent relationship in verses 1 through 4. You know, the home is the primary place for instruction of children. You know, one thing that disturbs me, and I can be very quick to jump on this, and maybe you're convicted about it too, we're quick to criticize our schools. We're quick to criticize our government and whatever. However, the way I look at it and the way the scripture teaches is the primary responsibility of the training of children is not the school, not the government, but the home. And so Paul begins by instructing the children ab about this relationship that the children have with parents. And we see it first in, in verses 1 through 3. In, in verse 1, he says, children, obey your parents. And, and, and very clearly, Paul is defining the relationship between a child and parent is that a child is given authority over, or a parent is given authority over that child. You know, there was a flawed strategy a couple of decades ago. And it sounds great to the ear, but it's really not biblical. And it was this, if you tell your child to do something, you better give them a reason. And it says, because I said so wasn't good enough. Sounds great, not biblical, not biblical, all right? As a parent, we answer to God, God and we're going to see that. And, and, and once we begin to try to explain what we're doing, then the child is becoming in the position of deciding whether that's right or wrong. And God didn't intend it that way. Now, I'm not saying that as we discipline, we don't instruct our children because we should instruct them. But we don't have to depend on that. You ever thought how God works in our lives? God works in such a way, and, and, and we may ask him, and God doesn't say, this is why I'm doing it, and you'll understand it later. God has authority over our lives. And God has placed the parent in authority over the child. And so he says, children, obey your parents as you would the Lord. The parent is placed in a similar position to that of the Lord, of authority, uh, the position of authority in the home. And his authority, God's authority, is ultimate. But God has delegated that authority to the parents. God has an order. He, 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 he establishes the home in order. Remember when Moses was called of God to go back into uh, Egypt 
And what did Moses say? God, I can't speak. I can't do this. And, and, and he thought he was going to get a pass on it. But what did God say? He said, I'm going to send Aaron with you. And Aaron, you will be as God to Aaron, and Aaron will be as a prophet to the people. What did God do? When he was preparing to do something and instruct, he put Moses in a position over Aaron, a position like unto God. Now, I'm not in any way saying that a parent is God. That's not what the scripture teaches. But a parent is a God-ordained authority in the child's life. Now, parents, we're going to get to that. You are responsible before God, and we're going to see to instruct your children. Uh, you answer to God as to how you parent. And so, but for children, if you're in the household, you obey your parents. Obey your parents. God calls you to do that. If you reject that authority, you're rejecting the authority that God has placed in your life. But second, we see honor your parents. So we see first that to the child, obey your parents. But then in verse 2, going back to the Old Testament and the Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. And he quotes, so it may go well with you and that you may have a long life in the land. You know, there does come a time when we go outside of our parents' household, whether we're in college or wherever we might be. And at that point, we may not obey them. We may not be able to talk to them and receive direct instruction, but we are still to honor our parents. We're to honor our parents continually. And the promise attached to this commandment, one of the ten for the people of Israel, was that it would go well with them. And we know that it did not go well with them for some generations, and this was one area clearly they did not honor God in. You know, in this age, I believe we have lost respect for elders. We have not respected in this technological age. A lot of young people think they know more than older people. But the truth of the matter is that this respect that has been lost for the elderly not only negatively affects a home, but it affects society. It can void the promise. And so you and I are to honor our parents. Now, I'm strange in a lot of ways. You say, well, I know that. You don't have to tell me that. But when I go to my home, my dad had his chair. I don't ever sit in it. Not to this day. I never sit in it. Mom says, your dad passed away. It's going on eight years ago. I said, I'm not sitting in dad's chair. That's his chair. So I'll sit on the sofa. I'll be, she said, that chair is more. I said, no, I'm not going to. I've never done it. Now, I'm strange that way, okay? I admit it. It's not wrong. It's not being rebellious to not sit in it, but it's my own way of honoring. There are more ways that I can do uh, than that, but that's certainly one way. So children, if you're in the home, obey your parents. If you're outside of the home and, and under your own uh, house, then you're still to honor your parents. But let's look at God's instruction for the parents. Verse 4, fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. You might say and be, have been taken aback when I said, it's okay to say because I said so. That doesn't give you a blank check, parents, to do anything. All that merely says is that you're not accountable to your child, you're accountable to God. And so what it teaches us here is that there is a way that we're to parent. And we're not to stir up anger in our children. We're not to exasperate our children. We're not to provoke our children. Listen, parents, do not be overbearing on your children. Discipline them, but do not badger. That's what it means here. Don't, don't parent in such a way that you provoke a child to anger. That also is not trusting God when you do that. You see, God wants the instruction to be godly and ordered, not from anger that would facilitate resentment, from one's child. My, my father was a disciplinarian, and, and I grew up in a day I, I was spanked, okay? I'll be honest. But my dad did not spank me in anger. One of the great lessons I learned, he had a, a business right on Confederate Boulevard in Business 460 in Appomattox, 
and we used to go up after hours if he had paperwork to do. Went with my sister one time. She wanted to ride shotgun. I wanted to ride shotgun. I was two years older. She got there, and then you know what I did, being the big brother, I jerked her out of the seat. The problem was Dad had a big glass window, uh, and he looked out, and he saw me dragging my sister across the way. I got a spanking with the belt, three stripes across. I played Little League baseball. I couldn't sit in the dugout, all right? The guy said, come on, sit down. I said, no, I'm all right, I'm all right, I'm all right. <laughs> you know what? I've never laid a hand in anger on a woman from that time forward. My dad disciplined me. He didn't do it to try to beat me down, to try to provoke me to anger. He did it to instruct. Parents, we need to parent that way. We need to realize that God has given us a sacred trust with these children, and we don't need to do so in anger. We model a, a Christ-like spirit, a, a discipline, an ordered way, precept upon precept. Parenting is not for the faint of heart. Parents, you have a window of influence on your children's life because they will grow up and they will move out of your home. In fact, I, I've shared this before, and so if you've heard it, I'm sorry, I'm going to share it again because new people need to hear it. My mom, when she raised us, was an active parent. She didn't just send us out anywhere. She knew where we would be, all right? But my mom had a brilliant strategy that I believe helped me, and if you will follow it, parents, it will help you, and it was this. Our home became Grand Central Station, all right? We lived in town. We had everybody, guys I played ball with, we'd have cheerleaders, we had middle schools, we had high schoolers. Everybody came to my house. Mom would feed uh, five, 10 people at one time. And she never explained why she did it. We just thought we were the fun house. We were right in town, you know. And, uh, and, uh, but she explained it to me when we got out of the house. She said, Rick, the reason I had your friends in our house is I wanted to see them to see who they were. But she said, that wasn't enough. She said, I want them to see me to know who I am. <laughs> so if you're out on a Friday night and they're trying to lead you astray, they see Barbara Ann's face and it helped. What does that mean to us? Be involved. Be involved in your children's life. If they're under your roof, know who their friends are. And I'm not saying be an ogre about it, but God has given you a responsibility. Parents, you have a responsibility. We move on in verses 5 through 9 to the slave-master relationship. And God gives instruction uh, to the slave. And again, it is a blessing from God, and many people went before us to eradicate the institution of slavery in our nation. And so we don't deal with this, except there is sex trafficking, there are other things that are happening of people that are taking advantage, but it's illegal, and I'm thankful that it's illegal in our nation today. But in the context of the New Testament, the slave-master relationship existed. In Luke 17, verses 7 through 10, Jesus spoke of the relationship, and he said if a slave works all day and comes in, he, he doesn't just sit down and eat himself, but he must first feed the master, and then after that, uh, he might be able to eat. What, what is Jesus saying in that context? For, for the slave-master relationship, it was around the clock. It was a 24-7 type of situation. And, and, and Jesus' heart was this, and Paul's heart was this, that, that if you were a master, that you would so be Christ-centered that your treatment of your slave would be better than you would treat a child. That if you were a slave, you, your work ethic would be so Christ-centered that you would stand out and be a witness maybe to a master who didn't know the Lord. But it was a 24-hour-a-day thing. So you say, well, how does that apply to us today? Is it just something we discard and say, no, I, I think there's a way that we can apply it today, and it's in the employee-employer relationship. Now, an employee and employer have a different, distinct relationship from slave-master in this. Uh, an employee only works X number of hours per day. If, if you're employed, 
you're on the clock and you submit to the will of your employer unless the instruction he or she gives totally contradicts God's authority because of that broad umbrella. But what is God's instruction for us today if we're an employee of someone else? Verse 5, submit to your master, submit to your employee, employer rather. Again, we see this word obey and it speaks to being under another. We're in a position. And so today, you're not to disregard your employer. You're not to speak down your employer to someone else. That's, that's not cool. And it's definitely not Christ-like. You're, you're not to do that. You're to honor. You say, well, I don't agree with what this company is doing. I don't agree with what this person is doing. Then you pray to the Lord about that. But as long as you're being paid by that person, honor, submit to your employer. Uh, secondly, submit with a good attitude. Notice what it says um, at the end of verse 5, in the sincerity of your heart, you're to do so as you would to Christ. Don't work only while being watched as people pleasers, but as slaves of Christ. Do God's will what? From your heart, from the soul, from the inner person. Serve with a good attitude as to the Lord and not to people. We're to submit with a good attitude. We're to, we're to work with a positive attitude. I love seeing people that work with a great attitude. It's infectious. Uh, there's a lady that works at Bojangles, Karen introduced me to a week or two ago. A wonderful person. I need to tell Carlos, that's a lady of the month, the year or whatever, but, but she's sort of a grandmother figure and she'll go in there and she tells those young people, now y'all need to do this and do that and they do it gladly. Why? Because she's a wonderful, wonderful person, a Christ-like example in the workplace. Don't you want to be a Christ-like example? Don't you want your work to be with a good attitude? Too many times it's not. I share about my mom. She used to give us chores and and I guess my OCD ways, I, I would make sure that uh, the carpet was perfectly clean. So she'd tell me, clean the carpet, man, I'd sweep the thing. It would be nice, I'd vacuum it. And she said, Rick, you did such a great job. And I told her one time, I'd rather been bitten by a hundred rattlesnakes. <laughs> I used a little bit of hyperbole. The job was done, but it wasn't done with a good attitude. The scripture says, don't be a clock puncher. Don't be a clock puncher. Don't have a bad attitude in work. Work with joy. One of the most fulfilling things is to work with a good attitude. And it, and it says also here, not only are we to submit to our employer, not only are we to submit with a good attitude, but we're to do so knowing God is watching. See, we focused three weeks on this God consciousness that if I'm a husband, I need to be a husband knowing God's watching me. If I'm a wife, how I respond to my husband, the Lord is looking. Children, obey your parents, what? As unto the Lord. And, and now parents, realize that uh, you too will answer to the Lord. Slaves, serve as you serve unto the Lord. Masters, don't get the big head because you're under the Lord and he's watching you. There's this idea of God consciousness that, that permeates everything we've looked at the last three weeks. Colossians 3.22 says, don't work only when being watched in order to please men, but work wholeheartedly fearing the Lord. Here in verse 6, it says that we're to work as to Christ. I wonder today, are you in a tough work situation? Are you underappreciated, undervalued? Do you feel as if you're not being heard? Keep your eyes on the Lord. Serve as unto the Lord. The Lord is watching and he'll take care of it. Remember when the people were in slavery uh, in Egypt, they didn't realize it, but God had his eye on them and his ear close to them. God is watching. But I want you to see a final thing. People are watching. It's not specifically mentioned in this text, but it is scriptural. That when we work, others are watching us. A few weeks ago, we looked in Acts chapter 16 and Paul was serving the Lord, and that serving of the Lord got him in trouble with the law, and he's in the jail in Philippi, and he is singing praises. The doors open. They begin to leave. 
The jail keeper fears he's going to lose his life. He's going to take his own life. And Paul says, wait, don't do so. He comes back, places himself in incarceration again. And the guy says, how can I be saved? He saw something different in Paul. I wonder in your life, is there an attractiveness that would draw people who work around you to the Lord Jesus Christ? Your work is your witness. People are watching. But then let's look finally. God's instruction for the master, for the employer. And I speak if you hire people, if people work under you. They work under you for X number of hours. They are not your slave. They don't work 24-7. Some employers, they are so driven by work, they think everyone else is the same. Employers, you do not own the lives of your employees. They have lives outside of the company. There are many companies and corporations today that are losing this battle because they do not appreciate the fact that their employees have life outside of the workplace. They're exacting on their workers. They're infringing on personal time. Paul writes here, treat your slaves, or in our context, those who are under you, who work under you, the same way. What way? What's the antecedent to that? The same way that he dressed the slaves. You Employer, submit to God. Can you imagine how the workplace would be if the boss man, the boss lady, was really uh, submissive to God? Be a boss with a good attitude. Don't be exacting. Don't treat people disrespectfully. Treat them with respect. In fact, one of the, the things that I admire most in an employer is an employer who is approachable, uh, can be approached, who hears, who sets the example. Be a boss with a good attitude. don't, Don't let people see you not doing something that they would think is beneath you. If you own a restaurant, get out there sometimes and and wipe the tables down, empty the trash. Don't ever show yourself to be above. Don't say, well, that's just somebody else. I've reached above that. Listen, Scripture says God is no respecter of persons. God doesn't look at you as being better than the one working under you. Don't look at yourself that way. In fact, make it very clear by your example that you will serve alongside those who work under you. There is a tremendous opportunity for a positive Christian witness when the employer does that. So as we close this series of messages on the family, if we could really summarize everything we have looked at in these three weeks, the husband's relationship to the wife, the wife to the husband, the child to the parent, parent to child, master to slave, slave to master, employer, employee, employee, employer. We would say this, be intentional. Be intentional in what you do. Are you parenting? Be intentional about it. Know what you're doing. Be involved. Have a plan. Be intentional. Are, are, Are you a husband and you've been given responsibility, spiritual responsibility? Don't just go through each day. Be intentional about it. Serve God in your capacity and seek the best of those who are in your closest circles. We've talked about the the, the truth, this whole series of messages, God consciousness. Whatever you're doing, say, God, I know you're watching. I want to please you. I want to do what's right in this situation. Do you pray for your employer? You should. Do you pray for your employees? You should. Pray for them by name. God bless them. God, you have placed me in a position over them. I want you to bless them. Lord, as you bless them, I believe you'll bless me. But even if not, Lord, bless them. Be a parent. Pray for your children. Because you know what? They'll get beyond your roof one day. And and there will be other people speaking to their ears. Pray for them. Pray if you have a wayward child. Pray, God, bring them back home. But if your parents, 
If you're parents now and your children in the home, follow God's counsel. If you're an adult child, you may not obey your parents at this time. That may not be called, but you're to honor them. You respect them. You, you, you gain counsel from them. You treat them with honor. You know, very few things can please God more greatly than God-centered homes. He created them early, and he created them with great intent. And one of the best ways that we can honor him is to be intentional in these relationships. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the institution of the family. Lord, for our husbands today, we pray for our wives. Bless them, strengthen them, protect them. Lord, use them in your service. Lord, for wives, they pray for husbands. That Lord, you would strengthen them, give them wisdom, protect them. Lord, as parents, we pray for children and grandchildren that, Lord, they would choose you in your path in a day when so many diverse paths are presented. And, Lord, for us as children, those who are young, we pray that you would help us to be obedient children. And, Lord, for us as adult children, that we would honor our parents. But Lord, in all of this, we're mindful that we are to have a God consciousness. If we're a parent, our instruction is not to be overbearing, but Lord, instructive, constructive. Father, while we may not answer to our kids, Lord, we answer to you, and that's what we learn from our text. We want to be the best we can be. Lord, we thank you that you did not leave us uh, without instruction in the family. So take the truths from the word that we read today and apply it to us. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.